A year ago, I made this sweet little guy. I used the Moonlight Jewel slash Blue Pixie Art Rabbit. That was actually a remix of the doll originally made by Delightful. It's a bit confusing. You too can make one of these scams for the low, low price of free with the STL file found on Thingiverse. Well, I shared him online and immediately my comments started to look like this. Okay, okay, I see you, I hear you, and against my better judgment, I'm complying with your demands. I hope you're happy. Anyway, here's Wonderwall. Since I didn't want this doll to look exactly like Elias, I had my wife make the cheeks a little bit bigger and the muzzle a little more squared. Because I want to put a hat on the doll later, we added a ball joint to the ears so they had more flexibility. Then, to make the legs seem a little more rabbit-like, we redesigned them to have legs that mimicked the long foot and high ankles of actual rabbits. Next, we printed the new pieces on our 3D printer and removed the supports then sanded the burrs left by the supports and the layer lines. In the hands and feet, we used Sandy, my Dremel, to drill holes in order to place steel wire inside. This is what the elastic will wrap around. Then we secured the wire in place with UV resin. Once that was done, I gave the pieces a bath in hot water with dish soap to remove the oils left by our hands. I love the big eyes on these dolls. I printed the same eye base that we made for Elias and pulled out my metallic acrylic paints. I started by applying two coats of a light blue base, then blended a darker blue to the outer rim of the iris. Once those layers were dry, I gently sand the sclera around the iris to clean up any oopsie moments. Then, with a black UV resin, we fill the pupil and cure that under the UV lamp. Next, we fill the base of the eye to the rim with a clear UV resin and cure that. Then we add a UV resin dome on top. After that is cured, we pour some UV resin into a cup and then dip the eyes into it to give them a wet, glossy look. A sloper is a basic pattern made with the specific measurements for the intended wearer. The sloper helps make other items of clothing without doing the entire drafting work over and over again. Since I'm making several items for this doll, I thought a bodice sloper would be useful. I began by taking several basic measurements, things like shoulder to shoulder or shoulder to hips. The first step is to draw your center fold. This is the length from shoulder to hip through the center of the body. Then mark the distance from the shoulder line down to the bust, the waist, the belly, and the hips with perpendicular lines. I added a belly mark because she has a rounder belly than her hips. Then I added her neck measurements and her neck to shoulder measurement. Then filled in the widths from the doll's center point to their side. This is simply a quick and dirty tutorial. Would you like to see a full video on how I made a sloper? The chemise was usually made of a light, less expensive material so it could be washed more often. It laid against the skin to absorb dirt and sweat instead of the more expensive gown on top. The chemise design didn't change much over the years, so I used the same basic pattern that I drafted for the Rococo doll, and used my sloper to figure out the basic measurements. This pattern uses a gusset for the underarm space, so I take the gusset and the sleeve piece and sew down one of the short sides. What I should have done first is sew the cuff on the sleeve, so I did that next. Then I take the perpendicular edge and sew it along the other short side. Then fold the sleeve in half and sew the remaining bit from the cuff to the gusset. Then pull the gusset out. The next step is to turn the sleeve right side out. No, I didn't, did I? 
Yep, I did. I sewed the wrong sides together. <sighs> okay. I fixed that and then sewed the top of the sleeve to the body. Because the armhole is so small, I hand sewed a back stitch all the way around. With the gusset now in place, I laid the sides of the body together and stitched them down. With a piece of bias tape I made, I sewed one side to the outer edge of the neck hole, then folded it over the raw edge and whip stitched the other end to the inside of the neck. The out of mine. Then I hemmed the bottom. Regency era petticoats were essentially skirts that were held up with shoulder straps. I found this pattern from a Jane Austen Society page and decided to adapt it to my bunny's measurements. It's a fairly simple two-piece pattern. I chose to use the same linen fabric I used for the chemise. First, I ironed out the wrinkles and then folded over one end to create my middle mark. Then traced on my pattern. Then used a clear sewing ruler to add a quarter inch seam allowance. Once the pieces were cut, I finished the edges with fray check. I begin sewing by cutting a hole in the back and sewing the edges. Then I lay the two pieces together, right sides facing, and sew up the edges. Next, I made some bias tape. The selvage edge is the rough edge, usually with glue or printing on it. Bias tape is cut at a 45 degree angle from the selvage. I measured out a tape width of one inch and cut it out. With my iron and my clapper, I fold a piece in half lengthwise. Then unfold the piece and fold the lawn edges to the center fold and iron those. Then encapsulate the raw edges by folding the fabric again lengthwise. Then you have a ribbon with most of its raw edges hidden. Bias tape is useful for sandwiching raw edges inside with a material that bends easily. I used it here to create a waistband. Lastly, I used thin white ribbon for the shoulder straps. The Regency era of British history officially spanned the years of 1811 to 1820. King George III succumbed to mental illness in late 1810. And by the Regency Act of 1811, his eldest son George, Prince of Wales, was appointed Prince Regent to discharge royal functions. Empire gowns were slim-fitting dresses with waists sitting just beneath the bosom. The name Empire comes from this look's popularity during the First French Empire and the fact that it was based mostly on the clothing from the Roman Empire. History. I've been a fan of Jane Austen books for as long as I can remember, so this has always been a favorite time period of mine. I start drafting by tracing the sloper. Then, using a pattern for reference, I draw the dress-specific details. I think my least favorite part of drafting is all of the math I need to use to shrink the patterns to a specific doll's size. It drives me bonkers. I wish I had paid just a little bit more attention in geometry class. <laughs> Also, do we want to take a moment to talk about how a year ago I had no clue what I was doing with my sewing machine, and now I'm drafting patterns? Like, where did that come from? Also, I recently discovered this fabric store that has a whole other room just like this one that is filled to the brim with apparel fabrics. That's where I picked out this thin, billowy fabric. Then I traced and cut out my pieces. What I don't show here is me cutting out lining pieces in a satin taffeta. First, I attach the front pieces to the backs along the side seam, and then along the shoulders. Then did the same thing on the lining pieces. Next, I base stitch along the top and bottom of I decided the basting wasn't working, so I tried to sew pin tucks. That didn't work, so I basted but sewed the lining in wrong. <laughs> this time, I basted and ruffled the front, and then attached the front lining around the neck. Then I trimmed the excess and turned the front right side out. I did the same with the back outer and lining pieces. Then I ran a basting stitch down the center to keep the fabric in place. Next, I sewed the front piece to the backs at the shoulder. Then, with the right sides facing, I sewed the side seams. 
Now onto the skirt. I sewed the front pieces to the front side pieces. Then I cut a slit in the back and hemmed around the raw edges. Next, I sewed the back piece to the front pieces. Well, this time I sewed the right sides together. <laughs> then I stitched the skirt to the bodice and lined the raw edges in the back with bias tape. Then stitched the bottom together to show off that adorable tail. For the sleeves, I did two rows of a basting stitch to ruffle the bottom. Then, with this gorgeous pink taffeta, I made bias tape to cap the ends of the sleeves. Then gathered the top of the sleeve with a basting stitch in order to add ruffles to the top of the sleeve too. Next, I folded the sleeve lengthwise and stitched along the length of the arm. Then, I hand sewed the sleeves to the bodice of the gown. For the hem of the dress, I thought a row of ruffles would look pretty, so I grabbed a strip of fabric and hemmed one side. Then I gathered the strip into a ruffle and attached it to the bottom of the skirt by stitching in the ditch. And it looks pretty cute. To make a matching sash to go under her bosom, I created more pink taffeta bias tape and sewed the open side closed with an invisible stitch. Then stitched it to the bodice. The middle of the dress closes with the sash, but I added a snap to the top to secure it. And then we're done with the dress. Well, except for the part where I tried it on the doll and the ruffle covered her feet. <laughs> so I ripped out the stitches on the ruffle and grabbed a strip of the pink taffeta. Then made some Rococo ruffles and attached that to the bottom of the dress instead. The Regency era had quite a few different styles of bonnet, but I chose to do a style that was similar to these. Based on a bonnet pattern made by Jelly Blythe, May designed the pattern in Blender. Then I transferred that design to my grid paper. First, I attached the tail to the perimeter of the crown. then turn it right side out. Then I sandwich a piece of stabilizer, the brim lining, and the brim exterior fabric, and sew around the outer rim. Once that is finished, I pull out my pinking shears and cut the excess fabric along the outside. Then turn the piece right side out. With the lace, I do basting stitches along the long sides and pull the back threads to make a ruffle. Then attach the ruffle to the inner brim with a back stitch. I overlap the top edge a bit just to make the ruffle a little more decorative. Wow! With my Mr. Chomp boys, I cut the excess fabric from the inner part of the brim. Then, with a strip of off-white taffeta, I sew a tube and then make additional ruffles to sew to the outside. Next, I attach the outer crown piece to the brim. Then sew my inner tail and inner crown pieces together just as I did before. Next, I sandwich the brim of the hat between my two crown pieces and sew them together. Then, with this stretchy pink lace, I sewed up tubes to act as my tying ribbon and stuff that inside the hat before closing the bottom sides. With the bonnet turned right side out, I closed up the turning seam with an invisible stitch. And oh my gosh, it looks so cute so far! As a final step, I glued some bows and flowers to the outside. A reticule is the name for a lady's drawstring handbag during the Regency period. Since I have no clue how to make one, I simply drew my ideal shape on graph paper and used that as my pattern. Then I embroidered a pretty rose pattern on the side. Next, I attached the outer and lining pieces together along the top seam. Then I sewed two parallel straight stitches to create a channel for my drawstring. With both sides completed, I sewed around the sides and the bottom, making sure to avoid sewing through the channels I created. Then, using a darning needle, I fed my cord through the channels and turned the reticule right side out. I then stuffed the bag with some fabric scraps 
and sealed the tips of the cord with a lighter. Lastly, with some glue, I fed the ends into some gold beads. The Regency shawl seems to be very reminiscent of the classical Greek and Roman fashions that had apparently made a comeback. Again, I embroidered a matching rose design to the ends of a strip of pink taffeta. Then I folded the strip lengthwise and sewed along the edges, but leaving a hole to turn the fabric right side out. Finally, I top stitched around all of the edges to close the hole and let the fabric lay down better. The Fichu is a sheer scarf that helped as sunblock, but also as a way to be more modest in these fashionable plunging necklines. <laughs> I found some sheer fabric in my stash and cut a triangle. Then I simply folded over and pressed the edges and then sewed them in place. Okay, so you might remember Elias's carrot cane from watching his video. Well, I knew I wanted to do something similar with this doll, and I figured a parasol was the perfect solution. So, my wife designed and 3D printed the solid parts for me. To create a pattern for the cage part, I used washi tape to cover the cage, and then drew along the spines and cut out those pieces. Then transferred my pattern to a piece of cardstock. I liked that this pink lace had a nice finished edge, so I fussy cut eight pieces along that pretty border. Then I sewed up the long edges. Now I have a pretty canopy for the parasol. The next step was to paint the structure pieces. I first coated them with a layer of Mr. Super Clear matte while wearing my safety equipment. From what I could tell from fashion plates, the cage part was made from a type of metal. So my first step is to paint the cage black and coat it with Mr. Super Clear gloss because metallic paints look best when painted over a glossy black. Then I coated it with some Tamiya silver paint. To continue with the metal coatings, I glossed the finial and the carrot handle. While those dried, I began to paint the stem of the umbrella, first with an all-over medium brown, and then lightly with a tan color. Then I dry brushed some paint to give my wood texture some depth. Then with the same carrot-colored bronze paint I used for Elias, I painted the carrot. Now that the cage was dry, I could glue the hood to the cage with glue. Next, Sandy stopped by to drill a hole through the center of the cage and stem so I could insert a steel wire into each. Then I trimmed off the excess with these Rest. wire cutters. Pew. Lastly, I glued the finial on top. Since I loosely based Elias's paint scheme on Thumper from Disney's Bambi, I felt compelled to base this doll's colors on Miss Bunny. I recently found this cool series of products that help make your 3D prints smoother. First, you spray the Mr. Surfacer 500 grit, and this helps fill in the big holes and ridges. Then you sand it smooth and repeat the process with the 1000 grit and 1200 grit until the print surface is even. Then I added a couple layers of Mr. Super Clear Matte. I started by mixing together the light cream color of the doll and spraying that on first. Then I mixed together the brown color and applied that. and sealed it all in with a few coats of Mr. Super Clear Matte. Now to breathe some life into this little bun. With my chalk pastels, I added some pink to the inside of her ears. And Miss Bunny has some very pink cheeks, so I couldn't forget that. 
and not to mention her precious little nose and mouth. I blushed the back of her ears and added definition to the molded hairs in the front. Then it was time for these little beauties. With my watercolor pencils, I added white to her waterline, added some definition to her upper eyelid, and drew on her basic upper liner and lashes. I also added some hair definition to the inside of her ears. Then, with chalk pastels, I painted some basic eyebrow shapes. With my new Posca markers, I darkened her lashes and brightened her waterline. I also painted the inside of her eye sockets, just in case this could be seen after putting her eyes in. Then it was time for another coat of Mr. Super Clear Matte. I added some base eyebrow hairlines with my pencil. Then, with some watered-down brown paint, I added some fine hairlines to the eyebrows and ears. Then, attempted some delicate eyelashes. After the MSC was dry, I procured these lightweight fakie lashes and attached them with tag Kilu. Finally, I used a gloss varnish on her waterline, her nose and mouth, and the inside of her ears. Look, this is what, my third or fourth BJD? And I still have trouble comprehending this part. There's such a fine balance between elastic being too tight or too loose. I don't know, it just makes me nervous. So, funny story, this doll was supposed to be part of a collab for Valentine's Day. And if you look at the calendar, you can probably tell that it's nowhere near February 14th. Anyway, we were pushing for the deadline, but I was still wrapping up the arcade video at the time. So, my wife did all of the stringing work. She began by stringing one leg, then passing one end of the elastic through the torso and into the other leg, then through both parts of the torso and into the head where she secured it in place with an S-hook. Because her legs are a bit bent, we added some wire to help her pose more easily. Then May strung the arms on their own piece of elastic through the upper torso. The ears are also on their own piece of elastic. They're looped through one ear, in and out through the head, and through the other ear then knotted and looped onto the S-hook. Then May glued the magnets to hold the back plate in place. After I knew we weren't gonna get her done in time, I decided to add some extra details, like shading her hands, and shading her feet just like I did with Elias. And some pink little toe beans. Shame. Shame. Well, here is the moment you've been waiting for. I am so very happy to introduce you to Lily the Rabbit. I hope you enjoyed watching this project as much as I enjoyed making it. If so, please subscribe and turn on notifications. If you do, then the evil YouTube algorithm will be forced to let you know when I make another crazy video. Also, I'm a tiny creator, so every subscription, bell ringing, like, share, and comment helps my channel grow and uh, keeps me excited to continue sharing my process with you all. Plus, I really, really love chatting with you all afterwards. It's uh, kind of my favorite part. So, uh, why did I name her Lily? Well, I secretly named Elias after Walter Elias Disney. 
And since this little beauty is supposed to be his perfect match in every way, I figured naming her after Walt's wife, Lillian, would be appropriate. Don't you think? Anyway, thank you so much for watching, and I hope you had a sweet time.